This is Ruben Lara, and you're listening to Ukra Media Podcast. Hello, Ukra Media family. Vladimir Pragnevsky here, and welcome to episode number 68 of the Ukra Media Podcast, where I serve our Ukra Media family with daily, that's right, daily interviews from highly creative people. And today's guest is Ruben Lara. He's a freelance illustrator and animator working in Massachusetts. But before I play my interview with Ruben, I want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Action VF. VFX.com. They have over 2,500 elements of professionally shot VFX stock footage captured on the latest RED cameras from explosions, fire, water, smoke, gun effects, debris, particles, weather, blood, and gore. They have your assets covered. Save on render time with real elements. No more simulations. Go to actionvfx.com. Again, go to actionvfx.com. And now, here's my conversation with Ruben Lara. Enjoy. Ruben, welcome to the show and share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Thanks, Vlad, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. All right. Um, well, my wife and I are avid swing dancers and specifically Lindy Hoppers. So wow. um, okay. met on the dance floor and never looked back. So Lindy Hop is is like, you know, slightly more advanced version of swing dancing, but just so, so fun. So, <laughs> and uh, another interesting fact, my best pet was a ferret named Saki. <laughs> Best pets wow. in the world. <laughs> Trash everything, but they're the best pets in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, so for those of us that don't dance, what can we do to get into dancing? Like, is there, because I'm intimidated. When I go to all these like studios, like even for lessons, yeah. like it's intimidating, man. Yeah. Well, okay. First of all, I mean, any kind of dance is basically the same thing. It's all about listening. It's all about your approach. A lot of people think like, ah, oh, I can't remember the steps, but steps are secondary. First part about partner dancing is having the mindset of listening to your partner. And it's really about responding to the other person. And even if your steps are totally off, you won't enjoy it if you're just thinking about you. If you start thinking about the other person, making the other person look good, you will have fun and people will enjoy watching you, whether you're a professional or not. And that's when you really start having fun. Oh man, anytime I get on the dance floor, dude, I get so nervous. My knees start to shake. Yeah, it's because most people are, are worried about what they look like, you know, yep. but I don't know. We've just, I, I'm not like the best, you know, lead in the world, but I have a good time because I'm, I'm responding, you know, to my partner and, and that's when you start having a blast. That's my advice. No, that's good. And my <laughs> wife loves to dance and I, I am just intimidated, but I'm scared of dancing. I don't know, yeah. just, it feels like everyone's watching you and, and then, well, it doesn't help that the, when we went dancing, like we, we had, we took some classes in Columbus, Ohio and, uh, the guy was just giving me such a hard time. Like he kept just picked one guy in the group to pick on. And that was me. It was you. It was me. And so it, that didn't help, man. He smelled help. the fear. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I need to go back because my wife. You can do dance. it. Yeah. I, I can, can do it. it. Well, my wife and I used to, do, used to do, I mean, we're not professional dancers by any means, but we, you know, we did like among friends a regular kind of dance class for a while. And it, it was funny because it's, it, it really was more about people's relationships and how they, how they connected with each other, you know? And so it really is about just listening, giving and taking with, with, with kind of a, a physical form of, uh, of, of listening. So, well, anyway, I'll have to make sure to stuff. schedule. Yeah. I'll yeah. schedule. Do a date and we'll go dance. Don't give up. <laughs> All right, Ruben, let's transition <laughs> talking about your creative journey, man. How did you get started in your creative field? Well, it was early. I, I was trying to think of, of maybe just, you know, the three people that were most influential to me. And first, my parents, specifically my mom, even when I was tiny, she critiqued me instead of placating me, you know, just making me feel that my work was amazing and putting everything up on the fridge. But <laughs> I think early on, she was able to just help me see that I there were things I needed to learn and grow. And that was, that was um, really helpful for my brain. And uh, she made me, or maybe I should say encouraged me, to take <laughs> computer programming in junior high, which I wasn't thrilled about at the time, but I'm so grateful now because it unlocked a technical part of my brain that has really served me well over the years. Do you code as well? Yes, I do. I, I'm not wow. an expert coder, but just enough to be able to either write my own you know, plugins or just helpful scripts for, you know, for, for my own production. That's and, very impressive. And that's wow. been super helpful over the years. Oh, I bet. Yeah. The other person is Debbie Allen. This was about 1985 when I was in fourth grade. She held art classes in her backyard. And I came to find out later, she had recently graduated from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. I grew up in Burbank. 
but she taught us what seemed like everything she knew from her from her her schooling and so we got this incredible exposure to some really meaningful concepts specifically not to be afraid of exploring media that was outside of our comfort zone and while creating art for myself was important learning to create art for others was the more important skill because ultimately it's about communicating something to other people and if they can understand what you're what you're saying then then you're just making it for yourself and ultimately that's what's you know what was going to help us make a living but instead of asking us what do you want to paint today what do you feel like it was more here's what you're going to do today and today is going to be oil and tomorrow is going to be a color chart and the next day is going to be gouache and so <laughs> it was just it just stopped all of us in that little class from being afraid of trying something new and that's um I think so important, especially now in this digital age when there's so many different tools to learn. So, And the third person that was really meaningful for me was Dwight Escoto. This was about 93, 94. At one point, he had managerial responsibilities at Universal Studios Art Department and then later left to create his own company, iCommunications, renting physical and digital props to television and motion picture productions. But he took a chance on me right out of high school at a time when digital workflows were just starting to become mainstream. Again, this was 93, 94, and I think Photoshop 1 was released early in 1990 or something like that. So computer graphics were coming into the industry. Old-time Teamster artists who were incredibly talented were not happy about it. You know, They were just really trying to keep their craft going. But computers were coming no matter what. So I really got to sneak into the industry at a crucial little window where almost nobody was really proficient with digital graphic design. So I really was able to learn a lot on the job without a lot of expectation. And I appreciate that um, Dwight, you know, saw that potential and and was willing to take a chance on me. And, And the great thing about the studio pace is it's just incessant. So everything is due yesterday. And studio prop work means you need to turn into a graphic design chameleon because you're constantly having to mimic someone else's work in one way or another. One day you're designing props for a modern day Cairo subway station. And then in the afternoon, you're replicating vintage cereal boxes from the 1940s. (laughs) And then you're creating millions of dollars of counterfeit studio money that needs to be shot, thrown out of a helicopter or something. So (laughs) it's just lots of research. It was lots of learning shortcuts, productive shortcuts, learning what shows on screen, which ultimately is understanding what matters to the client, what doesn't, managing your emotional involvement, versus what's cost effective. So yeah, it was it was such a great learning experience. And I still work with Dwight and his company down to this day. We've had a great relationship for over 25 years now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Sounds like you had a lot of mentors throughout your, your yeah, journey, really. definitely. I think that's probably like the key to your success. Now I'm curious, what was your first job in your field? Like my first paid job ever? Yes. It was in high school, my art teacher at the time, who was a good art teacher, even though most kids in art school, you know, they don't really care about the class. They're just there for the credits. But he really tried to look out for students who were serious about it. And he had a former student come back who had now owned a rubber stamp company. I don't even know if they're still in business now. Rubber Baby Buggy Bumpers. (laughs) <laughs> dot com <laughs> look and up. <laughs> um and uh, they reproduced some really kind of out there wacky pen stippled designs for for the rubber stamp set and so i did a you know a bunch of early designs for five dollars you know ten dollars <laughs> i mean he was he was really getting a lot of good work out of me early on <laughs> when i didn't understand the value of money or where no one else would hire me. So it was a good little relationship. But that was my first experience selling my art and selling my work. And so, yeah, a lot of this happened with people who were willing to, you know, see potential in, in young people. Now, speaking of experiences, let's transition to a dark moment in your life. I want you to tell us <laughs> the story of your worst moment in your creative journey. Well, I, I've heard a few of, of your podcast dark moments, and they're pretty dark. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't have anything that dark. And it's funny. I was, I was really trying to think about this, and I, I think I'm missing a gene in my brain because I, I don't feel stress a lot. <laughs> oh, man, nice. <laughs> so Pass that's a good thing, me. I guess. <laughs> It's That's not awesome. so good when when my wife is convincing me that this is a stressful situation. You need to stress I'm out. Like, well, I'm on. not stressed. Out. <laughs> but yeah, so that good. you know that's coming. It's coming handy in, in in my 
craft at least in some ways <laughs> i guess it's always made me approach failures as learning experiences so it's hard to say that any one, one of the one of them are the, are the worst in a way that really you know crippled my progress but um but i have learned over the years to set aside my emotional connection to my work in the right ways because you have to be emotionally connected of course and you have to care about what you're doing but i think that you have to care more about how your work is accomplishing its purpose. So I I do remember, I mean, like any creative, right, in in their field, creating work and and just having clients be so adamant that this is, you know, it's not it's not what they were expecting. And of course that, you know, that kind of sounds down into you. But yeah, I've just (laughs) I've just always kind of walked away from those experiences, reminding myself that it's less about what I think this means. And ultimately it's about what the client thinks it means. And and whoever needs needs to, you know, to to be looking at the work. I mean, once I had to illustrate a cross section of a prostate and all the surrounding cross section genitalia for a medical article, <laughs> and okay, I was proud of it until one of my friend's elderly mom saw it and said, "Oh, isn't that nice? A, a diagram of the inner ear." And then I thought, okay, everything is subjective. <laughs> <laughs> now let's shift gears and talk about something positive. Tell us the story of your <laughs> best moment in your creative journey. <laughs> All right. Um, well, one of my most meaningful moments. Okay, for a number of years, I worked alongside a creative team at the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, which is an impressive publishing company that creates Bible-based literature in almost almost a thousand languages now. Wow. And I was fortunate enough to work on a book geared toward teaching basic Bible lessons to children. First printing was about five million copies in English back in two thousand three, wow. and in two thousand five. A couple years later, my wife and I moved to Chile in South America, and we took a trip deep into the Andes Mountains to distribute some of this free Bible literature to super remote Spanish-speaking farming communities. That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And I remember this one moment where we met this young girl about eight or nine years old, gave her a personal copy of this book with lots of illustrations. And when we asked to meet her parents, she pointed up to what seemed like the sky, but it was really a steep hike up to our house. So of course, (laughs) you know, we're out of breath Americans by Chilean standards, at least. And we start, you know, taking this hike all the way up to our house. Well, we, we take a break about halfway up, but while we're resting, she immediately sits down on a rock and just starts pouring over these pictures. And I thought, man, this is what it's all about. A few months earlier, I had been in New York, surrounded by computers and Photoshop and printing technology and brainstorms and opinions, even a bit lost in the production of it all. And now here we were in the Andes after a several day trek, quite literally in the middle of nowhere, piking on the edge of a steep grassy mountainside, you know, with an incredible view of the mountain range. And this little girl who didn't have the vaguest idea about the paces of production had her very own full color illustrated book. And couldn't stop flipping through the pictures. And that moment has really stayed with me because most people don't understand what goes into creating a visual message. And so the real value of a thing comes from creating engaging, meaningful content. And I had the wherewithal at that moment to snap a little picture of her. And I still have that photo up on my wall, just just as a reminder of, you know, remembering what's important because we can get kind of caught up in even self-importance and the value of our own ideas. But man, when it comes down to it, if you can just create something that's going to, yeah, that's going to be meaningful. That's going to teach somebody, somebody, something, especially, you know, for our, our young people these days, that's where it's at for me. So that was, that was a good moment for me. No, and I I was listening to you. You're such a good, you're such a good storyteller. I, I forgot that I'm I interviewing you. <laughs> I was there with you as you were telling me the story. I'm like, oh, oh crap! I'm in, I'm interviewing now. I need, to, I need to look at our notes. No, man, that's that's awesome. Wow, I love how you you just painted that story. I, I really truly felt like I, I was there with you. Oh, uh, thank you. Now, Ruben, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by our friends from ActionVFX.com. They provide the best stock footage elements for professional visual effects, from explosions, fire and smoke, muzzle flashes and bullet shells and gun effects to debris and particles. They have your assets covered. Available in 4K, 100% royalty free. They also have over 250 free VFX elements for you to download. Stuff like free fire sound effects, spell hits, bullet shells, blood mist, bullet hole textures, dust waves, water sound effects, explosion sound, and 
and the list goes on and on. If that's not enough, then check out their tutorials and blogs. ActionVFX.com is a great online resource. Save on render time with real elements, no more simulations. Go to ActionVFX.com. Again, go to ActionVFX.com. And now back to the interview. All right, we're back from the break. Ruben, I have a total of, uh, I believe, like six questions for you. So first question, how do you overcome creative blocks? Well, I usually just take a break, do something completely different that is physical. I mm, try to stay away from going down the Instagram rabbit hole because it's never ending. <laughs> <laughs> and there goes your day right there. It totally does. And, <laughs> you know, there's some inspiration I can I can get for that for sure. But, man, the, the never ending stream... I find is a little bit exhausting and then I just, I just <laughs> so never true. end up doing anything, you know, <laughs> but if I take a break and do something physical, like tool around on the guitar, I'm not a good guitarist, but I know a few chords, you know, it just gets my brain out of the, out of the pattern, do a household chore. One of my worst thing, one of the things I'm worst at is remembering to eat while I'm working. <laughs> so I'll like, okay, now's the time that I can cook something. I'll make some eggs or something since I work here from home. So just doing something physical, it's usually enough to get my head out and reset. And if I come back and I'm still in that block, it's time for me to just force myself to start doing something so that there's no blank canvas in front of me. Because even a bad idea, I always find will evolve into something. And sometimes I'm just stuck because I'm afraid of doing the obvious, right? You kind of think, I got to be original. I got to be, do be doing something different. But sometimes the obvious thing is, is the clearest thing and the right thing to do. So just start with the obvious thing and move on from there. And I usually find that I, I will get to something that is a little more creative and, and unique. Now, if you can give one piece of advice to aspiring illustrators and animators, what would it be? Don't be afraid to dive in. I firmly believe that artistic ability is not genetic and it can be learned because if a skill can be replicated consistently, if you can have consistent success in something, it means there's a process. And if there's a process, it means it can be learned. I think that inclination might be genetic. Like, for example, we might be inclined toward working with people or animals or, or technology or toward patterns or outward thinking versus inward facing stimulus. But if you're dedicated and you're willing to put forth the time and effort and patience, you can learn to communicate effectively through the visual arts. So don't be afraid of, of how much talent you think you have or don't have. And as, as far as actual technique, I would say don't be shy about tracing work to start out because a lot of artists feel like they just, you know, they're on Instagram all day long. And so the, the goal is let's do something unique that a bunch of, no one's ever done before. Well, that's an incredibly overwhelming and daunting ask. And, and learning to create art for me is very much like learning a language. You know, you don't start out trying to write an essay in a language you don't you can barely pronounce. You start out by imitating sounds and reciting pre-written simple phrases and then in time words and and then in time your own ideas can be expressed. And I find it's the same with art. You have to get those neural pathways open to new patterns and get your hand and your shoulder used to new movements. And tracing and copying is a great way to do that at the beginning. So swallow your pride, trace a bunch of stuff you like and just get your brain and your body used to to those physical movements and those mental ideas and then slowly that language is going to be more part of your physical self and then you can start doing things that maybe no one else has done no oh, great advice now how do you okay this one this one's a tough one because this was something i struggle okay. with how do you balance work and personal life and i guess this the follow-up to that would be how do you unplug well my spirituality is is very important to me my wife and I are both avid Bible students as well. And through my study of the Bible, I've learned the value of, as one scripture says, making sure of the more important things. And that's basically learning to set priorities. And for me, that means, you know, number one, my relationship with the creator. Number two, my relationship with my wife. Number three, my responsibility toward my neighbor. And then my art career in that order. And even though that puts art in fourth place, it totally works for me because when my important relationships are healthy, I'm always in a good place to work hard, learn productively, be patient with clients and all the skills anyone needs to be effective in their craft. And it might feel a little counterintuitive to, you know, to say that I put my art career in kind of in that order, but I only feel that I'm good at my art career when my personality and my, you know, my thinking ability 
has stability, you know? And, and for me, that all comes from my relationships first. So, and, and by putting those other things first, that's how I unplug because, because those other things are also important to me. It, it forces me, you know, to get out of sitting in front of my Cintiq all day long. And it's good. It's just, it's good for my brain. Love it, man. That's perfect. Now, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? All right. I've always, if I had the time in another life, I would love to be an oceanographer. <laughs> but <laughs> really? of course that means, you know, being on the ocean for a year at a time probably or something like that. But man, I I think under the ocean is probably the, one of the closest things to being in outer space. There's just so much to learn. So oceanographer, the other two are leather worker, which is probably more doable for me. <laughs> Uh, just I love working with my hands and you know creating things and people love leather craft. And um, third is cowboy. <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> it's like my secret dream. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> it's funny because when we were in Chile, it, it was super rural, and we actually lived on a farm with over twenty horses, which was awesome. And um, the the local Chilean boys who grew up on the farm, working with horses wanted to be anything but and so they all had you know baseball caps that said new york on it and everything possible that was opposite from you know their dad and here i am <laughs> from new opposite. york like i'm putting a big old leather cowboy hat on and doing everything i can to you know to be them so i guess everyone that's wants hilarious. to be what they're not it's kind of like that joke that you know I, I think i saw like this like illustration somewhere before where this lawyer in front of his desk and he's dreaming of being like a, a beach bum you know and there's there's a beach bum dreaming of being a lawyer yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> we need more time <laughs> now share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success i think well most of my work is with clients so listening asking lots of questions Oddly enough, refraining from commenting or committing rather to my own ideas too early in the process. And, and clearly there's a place for my own ideas because that's why clients you know, are coming to anyone um, is to, to understand how to communicate in a more consistent way. But I feel that as the person initiating the creative process, knowing when to include my ideas is important because I feel that when I do it too soon, it, it just cuts off even their own perception of their own ideas. It just kind of creates a ceiling all of a sudden. But if most of the client's ideas form the foundation of the work, they'll stay more invested throughout the process and will ultimately be much happier with what they're walking away with because they have a sense of ownership, which I'm happy to share with them. And and that expands my where I am in my comfort zone too. If I'm just constantly saying, all right, here's what you got to do, I find I'm not growing and learning either. And even though... I know I'm the one with the knowledge of the language. You know, the message is coming from them. I'm just helping them put it into this new language. So I think listening early on is has been a good habit for me in my uh, client success. Now, where do you get your inspiration from? I love nature. I love, well, if we're talking about a specific artist, it doesn't, I love the technical. It doesn't matter. Just anywhere. yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Anything goes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think people, nature, the mechanics of nature are just fascinating to me. I often think about how much effort people put into technology, like Boston Dynamics and these incredible robots that they're making. You know, right. millions and billions of dollars, and we're so amazed, and yet we're you know we're swatting a fly which is probably like one of the most advanced robots in existence, you know? <laughs> and so kind of going down into the, into the details of nature to me is mind blowing. And I feel like there's always something new to learn there. And then when you really look at some of what people consider the most creative content in entertainment today, that's what they're doing too. You know, it's not until you look at some nature shows about these, um, unknown you know birds or things under the ocean you're like wait i saw that on on star wars <laughs> you know, and it's like okay this is where people this is where many creative people are getting their inspiration from and the closer you look at nature the the more the more variety you'll see the more creativity you'll see so i often do that now uh, recommend an internet resource that you find helpful in your work or personal life yeah i actually have both personal life not to get too preachy here jw.org <laughs> the official website for Jehovah's Witnesses. Surprisingly, only a small percentage is about Jehovah's Witnesses. The majority is articles for daily living, how to manage stress, tips for maintaining marriage, lots of content oh, for wow. 
issues teenagers are going through super practical. So I, I reference that a lot for myself. For work, two in particular, Matt Kaur at controlpaint.com. That's C-T-R-L paint.com. He is such a good teacher. He he teaches in a really methodical, paced way. Specifically, if you go to the free video library, he totally breaks down just about every aspect of digital art. He uses mostly Photoshop, but you can apply just about all his techniques in your software of choice. So great place to learn for free if you're just getting into the digital space. And also Scott Eaton's Bodies in Motion. And if you want a great resource for an anatomy reference, there's no better place because he is all about dynamic movement. And I'll often just kind of hop on there and do some figure studies. So yeah, those are those are two two spots that I've either been to a lot in the past or that I keep going to. Sounds good. And last question, how can people get in touch with you? All right. Well, my website, rubenlara.com has all my social media there, but also my Instagram, rubenlaraart, gumroad.com, rubenlara, youtube.com, rubenlara. And also make sure to check out two other projects that I'm really trying to get off the ground recently. And one is uptownferret.com, which is just a small boutique animation studio I'm starting up with friends. And we're mostly using Clip Studio Paint for a 2D animation. But yeah, it's a good group of artists and just really talented people I'm working with. And also whiteboard-animations.com. I feel like there is a huge hole in the whiteboard animation segment because so much of it is just automated and uses clip art and very few studios are are creating custom whiteboard animations, oh, which whiteboard animations are a great way of, of teaching complex information because you're, the format allows for a little bit of humor alongside, you know, the audio that you're listening to. So the, the way I'm doing it is, is, is everything is custom made and it's actually the project that generated the After Effects plugin that I coded and I'm selling on aescripts.com, which is marker remap. It's a wow. after after effects. It's not a plugin. Actually, it's a script that retimes pre comps using split timeline and layer markers. And so I recorded all of these hand motions on green screen and needed a way to just at will call up certain hand, hand motions for these whiteboard animations. So it's kind of a, of a hybrid between hand done whiteboard animations and a little bit of automation, but I really feel like they're much higher quality and so, yeah, I'm trying to spread the word on whiteboard-animations.com. Sweet. All right. Well, Ruben, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, man. We appreciate it. Thank you. I had a great time. Keep up the good work yourself. Hey, thanks. All right. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ruben Lara. Ruben, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy chatting with you. Make sure to check out rubenlara.com. Again, it's rubenlara.com. And as always, all the links and resources mentioned in this episode are also available on our website at ukramedia.com slash 68. And make sure to check out actionvfx.com. Remember, they have your assets covered. Over 2,500 elements of professionally shot VFX stock footage captured on the latest RED cameras from explosions, fire, water, smoke, gun effects, debris, particles, weather, blood, and gore, go to actionvfx.com. Again, go to actionvfx.com. And lastly, don't forget to join our online mentoring group on Facebook. Simply go to ukramedia.com slash community. We have well over 3,000 people in this group. It is a great online resource for those of you trying to grow, and it's absolutely free. Thank you so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. I appreciate you and I look forward to serving you in the next episode of the Ecremedia Media Podcast. Bye-bye. <laughs>